Welcome to the Star of Brian. Give us a hint, just like some things early on. Like, what was it like growing up in, uh, is it Worcester? Worcester. Worcester. Yeah, Worcester. 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 Not Worcester, Mass, which we got confused with quite a bit. Oh boy, yeah. I mean, actually, that's a that is a good place to start because uh, I do trace a lot of kind of my entrepreneurial roots back to my my home life, and it does kind of define who I am. Certainly, um, I grew up in a very strong family. My mom was a newspaper reporter for the Akron Beacon Journal, working out of the home, um, and so and she was covering courts and cops and elections, and so the discussions around the dinner table often were. Uh, you know, who was getting in trouble in the community, you know, who was, uh, you know, I mean, murders, rapes, crime, I mean, it was, it was Worcester's a town about 25,000. It has a branch of Ohio State, their Agricultural Research Institute, that used to be the hometown of Rubbermaid, uh, which is no longer there. Uh, so my mom's influence certainly uh, had a big role in who I am today, obviously, the journalism side. And then my dad was um, was an entrepreneur in a family, ran our family business, which was a car and uh, truck dealership, uh, specializing more on the truck side of the business, uh, which had been in the family 45, 50 years. Um, he ran that, but you know, what was really interesting with my father was uh, when I was in middle school, just going into high school, he pivoted and sold off the family business and decided he was going to become a financial planner and started a new business, which, you know, that really that had, a big, man, that was a, big yeah, had a big impact on me. You know, some, some guy in his 50s that, like, just decides to change it up and, and move in a new direction, which obviously you have to do as an entrepreneur. Uh, so, um, grew up with two, two older brothers, so a pretty uh, male-dominated, male-dominant uh, competitive environment. As you mentioned, uh, I was a soccer player, played through high school and college. Um, and it was a great place to grow up. I love being from Ohio. I wouldn't want to live there in my 30s, 20s, 30s, or 40s, but uh, certainly it was, a, it was a great place to grow up and a really strong knit kind of Midwestern roots. And um, I think that's a, that's a big part of who I am today. You still play soccer? I do. I do. I'm, I've got kind of a hamstring injury right now, but uh, I get out there and I play. I play a, a game, a pickup game on Sunday, and I play on. Um, Really, this cool game that takes place Monday, Wednesday, Fridays in the afternoon, and it's one of the benefits of running your own business. You actually can cut out occasionally to go and uh, get some physical exercise. But it's a cool game because it is the most diverse spot on any given moment, on any given day in Seattle. I guarantee it. Uh, it's a, it's on the Queen Anne Bowl field, uh, just midway up from Seattle Pacific there. And I love it because, I mean, there are Africans and South Americans, uh, Brazilians, Mexicans, and it's just this, this wild clash of cultures out there. And it's, cool. and it's one of the things I love about soccer is that you can, you can take your love of that sport anywhere in the world and, and people will embrace you and, and yeah. you can get along with, with it, anybody through the language of soccer. So it's one of the great things about that game, among other things. So, so what did you want to do when you were growing up? Oh gosh, well, the, my earliest memory, I wanted to be a professional um, colorer. A colorer? Yeah, like, no. What's a professional? With crayons. I wanted to be a professional uh, color. Yeah, colorer. Nice. That was my first memory. Um, <laughs> you know, getting it into the. Uh, into the high school years when you really start to think about that and into college. I, I didn't really have a real set plan on what I wanted to do. Um, I was a history major in college. I was super into history growing up. I uh, was really into the Civil War. I went to Gettysburg College, obviously, the site of one of the famous battles in Pennsylvania, uh, and um, just had a real love of history. And I didn't know if I could actually turn that into a job or career or anything, but one thing that my, my parents did instill in me was to just always follow your passion and just if you love something, you can you can make something out of that. And uh, so they were never real strict on any of us, uh, any of the three boys they had. And like, you got to be a lawyer or a doctor or follow this path. It was more about do what you love and follow your path, and you, you'll be successful. And I mean, I look at my other two brothers. One went to the Naval Academy, so a pilot that pilot with UPS, and my other brothers. Uh, uh, a geologist and as a principal at an environmental en en environmental engineering company here in town. So I think it paid off. Yeah, it worked, and we all took very different paths. Yeah. 
but um, I think our, our all of that upbringing was just really, really important for us. Yeah, passion. Passion yeah. has a lot to do with it. Um, did you did you pick the college? Did you pick Gettysburg? Like, like, it's not a big college. No, it's small. It's about three thousand people. Yes. Um, I just soccer. I, I I wanted to get out of Ohio. I wanted to. Uh, I was I was really into history and I had a great history program. Um, it, it was college was a challenging time for me. I, I, you know, a lot of people go to college and they think it was this. You know, it's the great. They look back and it's the greatest part of their life, and it really wasn't for me. It was really kind of a struggle because I was I was a bit of an oddball there because uh, no one. I mean, everyone was from different like private schools from Boston and Connecticut and you know and this East, it was a real East Coast mentality there and I just it was very foreign to me I'm glad I got exposed to it but it really wasn't for me I mean it goes back to those kind of Midwestern roots where I mean the town I grew up grew up in there was one high school and I had friends across the social strata I mean people who were dirt poor to very very well off um, and it didn't really matter, and so I went to this place where it was a bit elitist, and I just, you know, it was a big fraternity system, and I just didn't, that didn't mesh well with me as much. Um, and so it was a bit of a struggle. I, I stayed there all four years, in part because uh, I was doing better academically than I ever had. Um, my high school, I always thought I was the dumbest guy in my class, because I was surrounded by, my friends were very, very smart, and I, you know, were going to top-notch schools, and, I just, I just thought I was kind of this underachiever. So when I went to Gettysburg and I started doing well in college, I was like, oh man, you know, this is, this is working. And then the soccer component also was working quite well for me uh, there. And so yeah, it, it was, it was an interesting experience though. So um, what was your first paying job? Yeah, that um, wasn't with relatives. Wasn't with relatives? Yeah. Like, well, frankly, it was with relatives, and that way, and it, it was a job that I, that I did throughout high school. Uh, first paying, uh, first paying job is probably a soccer coach for like PD kids. But the but the one that I did most consistently was, and which kind of ties back into what I do now, was I compiled obituary information for the Akron Beacon Journal through high school, and that job entailed me calling up the funeral homes in our county and asking who died that day. And uh, it was great exposure to journalism. Uh, and it was it, it, it was a job that you know it was it was kind of one of these jobs that my mom. This was the great thing about my mom working out of the home was she could slough things off on me, and she she just like she would take me out to do election coverage with her, and you know ta help help her tabulate votes, or or she would throw me the obituary stuff. So every day at about you know three or four in the afternoon after school, I would go home and I'd call up the funeral homes and I'd ask who died, and you know and the funeral homes they had these wild crazy sense of humor actually it's 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 they've seen, they've seen everything I mean it's just like and so it was really an unusual job but it but it paid pretty well uh, it was I think it was ten bucks a pop so you know, almost 70 bucks a week uh, for a kid you know and every day and it didn't matter if no one died that day you didn't even have to compile the information and send it in so uh, it could be really easy it could just be a matter of calling up and I would just say, hey, this is John Cook from the Beacon Journal. Um, yeah, do you, have, do you have anything for me today? And I'd be like, oh, no, nothing today. <laughs> and uh, so that was probably the first true job. I don't think this, that's what really got me stuck on journalism, but uh, it was interesting nonetheless. What got you to So my older brother, uh, Dave, who I mentioned, uh, who's the environmental engineer, uh, had lived out, is, has lived out here for 20 plus years. He was living here. I wanted to get out of Ohio, I wanted to do something new. Uh, I worked at the Beacon Journal for a year after college, uh, doing more in the writing area. Um, and so there was some nepotism for me getting started in this in this path that I'm on now, certainly. Um, and I just decided to move out here. I came out with uh, three of my closest friends and we, we took root and uh, just started to fall in love with the place. And I, I, the first year I was out here, I actually, my brother was living in Capitol Hill, and I slept in basically the back patio that had been converted into a, a unit to some degree, and it was sloped, you know, it was sloped, so the bed had like bricks on it, and it wasn't heated, and, but it was great. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't change it. No. I don't take much. I don't, I don't have many frivolous uh, pursuits. So, so your first kind of real gig that I guess most of the audience, like Eastside Journal, is 
Was that kind of your first real... Yeah, real yeah I, I did. When I first moved out here, I, I worked probably 12 jobs in 18 months. I mean, I worked for, in the temp agencies. I, I, I worked at the Harvard Exit Movie Theater for a while. I did some... I worked at Seattle Filmworks in customer service, which was a terrible job. I hated that job. That was kind of, I, I'm a pretty hard worker, but that was one I, I could I could I had to just step away from. It was awful. Uh, so I did all these random things for about uh, 12 months, and then I probably had that moment like, okay, what am I going to do? And I had some experience with journalism and writing, so I started applying for writing jobs around town and uh, got a job at the East Side Journal, which is out, which was out in Bellevue and uh, started covering business. I was kind of a general assignment business reporter. And then um, all of a sudden the technology reporter left and I got thrown into this position as their technology reporter. And I was totally intimidated and scared and did not want the job. I, I, I just, I had been, I went to study in Spain uh, when I was a junior in college for, for a semester. And you know, so I was over there six months, and I came back, and so my beginning of my senior year, it was like, that was the moment this, this thing had turned on. The internet had turned on, like in that six month period, I was gone. And everyone was starting to use email. Lessons plans were starting to be put online. Sure. And so this was 93, 90, roughly 93, 1993. And so I came back and I, I was like, wow, I kind of missed something here. And um, so I was a little intimidated by technology. I was never, uh, uh, you know, really into it like you see with some people. Uh, and so I, I was a little reluctant to be thrown onto this beat. I was like, how am I going to cover this? I don't, I don't know anything about this world. Uh, you know, the people are so intelligent and smart. It's very challenging. Um, but the editor decided, hey, you're my guy, and we're going to put you on the beat. And you know, from there, I actually, um, so I mean, what year was that? So that was probably 97, I would guess. Yeah, right, 97, 98, maybe? 17 um, years. You know, gosh, yeah. Yeah, 17 really? years. Really? 17 years later, now it's, now you, you're pretty comfortable in technology. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've grown, grown accustomed to it. And uh, the nice thing about that is I feel like I've kind of got an MBA over the years and really understand kind of the business component yeah. of what it takes to build a business and a startup company. But it was a pretty critical decision for me back at the East Side Journal because the technology beat was kind of everything. I mean, you, and it was just just me, you know. And I was at this very small paper, and I made the critical decision at that time that, gosh, I wasn't going to make any headway trying to cover Microsoft, which was right in the backyard, and there was an interest for the paper to cover that. Um, and I just, I was just kept banging my head against the wall, and I made this decision. You know, they're not going to pay any attention to this little you know, piddly wink newspaper in their backyard. They don't care, and it's, I'm not going to get access. I'm not going to be able to make any inroads there. Um, so I actually sat down with, uh, there was a law firm moving into town at the time called Venture Law Group, and a, a lawyer there by the name of Craig Sherman, who a lot of people probably in the startup community know to this day. He actually happens to be our lawyer at GeekWire. Uh, and I sat down with him, and I was like, gosh, this is really interesting, Craig. What are you guys doing here? You're, the Silicon Valley firm is moving up, putting a, a law firm up here to just serve as start, startups? What's this all about? And it's like, yeah, we think Seattle is going to be the next hotbed for startup activity. Uh, we're putting our roots here. We're making a big bet. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. I think I can run with this. I think this is something here. Yeah, and I was like, I, this is more exciting to me than trying to cover Microsoft. And so I really, that meeting was really pivotal for me in terms of just kind of deciding that I wanted to cover startups and earlier stage companies, in part because I could break news, which has always been important to me, and I could get access, and I could do something creative and unique that no one else was doing. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you know I really took away from my mom uh, as a reporter, she was really good at carving out her niche and like developing a moat around her beat that you know no one could really touch. And that once you do that, you can really be strategic in how you how you expand that. And she was just really smart about she owned Wayne County. That was the county that she she covered and, and no one really messed with it. She knew everything going on and she was super plugged in to everything that was happening. And I that's been kind of your model. That was kind of my model. It's just I want to know everything going on in the startup scene. And no one else was covering it. And so it was it was a total greenfield.
And luckily, you know, it was right before, that was right at kind of the dot-com boom period taking off. And so then I just started to cover that cycle. And then people really got interested in a lot of this stuff that was going on. Yeah, right, uh, uh, yeah so the yeah. Avenue A's and Info Spaces of the world. And, wow. so, so you went to uh, Eastside Journal and then, uh, what was that, uh, PI, South PI? Was, that, was there anything between and then, and then GeekWare? Yeah, so I went to the Seattle PI, the daily newspaper here, and I was there for about 10 years. Yeah. And continued on the startup beat. Uh, there, it was an important uh, discovery for me because very early on, I um, decided that the news hole was shrinking for uh, party foul. Right there. <laughs> um, so the news hole was shrinking for the print product and decided that I was going to shift most of my coverage online. And the thing with covering startups at a, at a big newspaper like that, no one knew what I did. No one had any clue what startups were, what venture capital was. I mean, occasionally I would get a story and it would take off, and I'm like, wow, that's interesting. But, but they did not understand the dynamic of it at all. And so it was kind of nice, because I could kind of just run free there for, yeah. for a while. So when I made the decision, okay, I'm just going to cover things online, and that's going to be where, where I'm focusing my efforts. Um, that's just what I did. And so I developed, luckily in hindsight, developed what was called John Cook's Venture Blog at the PI. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it was it was nice because it happened to be branded under my name. Yeah. And so uh, that was a that was a good lesson in terms of you know branding under your own per, your, you know your own personal brand does matter. So then that did help uh, for for me in terms and Todd Bishop, who is the co-founder of Equire. He did, he did much the same thing when he, when he was at the PI, very early to switch on to, to online um, online journalism, develop a brand around his his name. His happened to be Todd Bishop on Microsoft. Yeah. And so... He the two, Microsoft. Yeah, the, the, the two of us, we've always been in very much in parallel in terms of our, our career, in terms of he's always been covering kind of big technology, and I've already always been covering startups. So in that regard, we're very, uh, very much in parallel. It's, it works very well. But yeah, that was a good lesson on choosing something around our personal brands. That made it much easier when we did decide to leave the PI. We actually tried to start what essentially became GeekWire at the PI with a spin-out publication. We had a, we had a full 25-page business plan that we were pitching to the editors and the powers that be there, and that was just it was just a dead end. I mean, it was there was so much complexity there in terms of. It was owned by Hearst out of New York. There was a joint operating agreement between the Seattle Times and Seattle PI. Uh, it was a union shop. I mean, it was so complex. And eventually we decided, hey, there's just no way we can do a spin out the way we want to do it. So we did an interim step where we went, we uh, partnered with the Puget Sound Business Journal, and Todd and I started a site called Tech Flash. Uh, we were there for two years, uh, decided that uh, we didn't want to be part of a media bureaucracy anymore. Uh, because we had just been part of one, and uh, partnered with Jonathan Spizzato, uh, whose office happens to be in this building on the first floor, uh, who's a Seattle entrepreneur best known for selling um, two, two, two companies to Google, most recently being Picnic. Um, and he was like the fourth guest here, actually. Oh, was he? Oh, interesting. Yeah. So he's our he's our main angel investor and the chairman of GeekWire. Partnered with him, and we got the got the business rolling and we launched the site in a weekend and haven't looked back since. Yeah. So tell us now some things like three years, right? Three Coming three, March seventh will be our third third year. Third year anniversary. Yeah. Yep. So So come out to our anniversary batch yeah, on exactly. March twentieth. That's yeah. our that's yeah. the flyer that was on your chair. Yeah, that the is ping pong ping pong ping tournament. Ping pong yeah. tournament. Yeah. Uh, it's so, always fun. All your all the all the wire batches are fun by the way. Um, so keep that up. We, we have an element of fun that we like to inject into business. So, so tell us about you know those three years you've been in that world. You're a startup. It's like you're covering here, except you are one. Granted, you have a little bit of firepower behind you because you've kind of done it. But uh, tell us some low lights of the last three years. Low spots, not the high spots. Yeah. The low well, spots. I mean, first off, as as you pointed out, the the great thing about the position that. Um, I've been in is having done this for as long as I have, I, I've been able to pick up hundreds of lessons of other startup companies and watch very, a lot of them fail and tank. And I've interviewed hundreds, probably thousands of CEOs of startup companies at this point. So I have a real insight into 
what can work and what can't work. Yeah. Um, and that's just been this great education, so I feel like I'm really blessed that I'm in this position to actually do my own startup and to have all that education behind me uh, that I've picked up over the last 17 years, as you pointed out. Uh, and, you know, highlight lowlights. I mean, gosh, it's been a real rocket ship ride from day one, from the day that we, like... You shot your YouTube video, Pioneer Square, right? That's right, yeah. I mean, and just the... It's just been it's just been so crazy looking back at everything that's happened to uh, try to think about it in historical perspective, which I should since I'm a history major. But uh, gosh, um, there have been challenges in terms of uh, hiring. I would say, uh, you know, and you hear that from. I, I, I'm trying to say this in a more creative way because I know you probably have guests up here, and every time you ask them, like, what's the hardest thing about your startup, they all say. Hiring and personnel. I mean, and, and it seems cliche to just kind of, you know, say the same things. But uh, but you know, we've we've uh, we've done well on some. We haven't done well on others. So that's been that's been probably the biggest challenge. And for us, having not come at this um, as managers before, you know, I've never really managed anybody. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's probably uh, there there is weakness on my part there that I I know I could probably do better in terms of how we manage people. And I mean, we're a pretty flat organization, and it's... How many people are there now? Yeah, so uh, we are at eight people, eight. roughly. Yeah, so in fact, we just hired a new person, Elena, who's here tonight, so make sure you say hi to her. Uh, she's coming on board as our, basically our glue to do everything in the business, yeah, which, the everything person. Uh, Elena, we still need to get a title for you, which <laughs> maybe it's the everything person. But, uh, and then our, our second most recent hire is Dan Rossi, who's here as well, who we hired uh, just a, two or three months ago. Uh, he's our chief business officer, um, and basically makes sure that the business is operating, handling our advertising sponsorships, helping me with events and, and whatnot. Um, and then he has a counterpart, Sarah Camp, who's our chief sales geek, who's also on the sales side. And then uh, on the editorial side, it's Taylor Soper, uh, who's a great, he's been, uh, he's great, been done a couple of more yeah, he's just a great up and coming journalist and a real talent. Uh, and then Todd and myself, and then we have a correspondent down in the Bay Area as well. Yeah. So that's, we're lean and scrappy. I mean, if you, if you look at uh, a lot of our competitors, I mean, uh, they are having, many of them have 50, 70, 100 plus people. Uh, yeah. So we feel like we really punch above our weight at GeekWire. Uh, and we really kind of like that scrappy style to our startup. So, so tell us, tell us, like, what's been the um, what's been the, the CEO that you talked to that you were most surprised wasn't successful? <laughs> That's an interesting way to phrase it. Like, it was like, it was like this guy has got everything. This guy's gonna, it's gonna, this is perfect. This is wonderful. There's no way this guy's going to lose. And then six months later, a year later, it's like, holy crap, what happened? What story around that is... I you're just really surprised. I, I tend to remember the guys who just were uh, over-the-top flamboyant and burned out badly. <laughs> you know, like, because they're the better journalism. They're, they're, the, they're, better the, better, they're the better stories, yeah, frankly. Because, story, yeah. you know, you just had so much fun. I, so I remember the people who went to jail because they screwed their startups so bad. <laughs> so, you know, like the, the CEO of Intellium. Yes. Or the company I covered at the PI, uh, Zenetics. You know, I, I, I mean, who, a guy who's still in federal prison. You know, I mean, these are the guys I tend to remember because I spent a lot of time digging through some of those, uh, some of those things. Um, you know, that's a good one. There's a guy. There is a guy uh, who had a had a uh, startup that went. It was, and I guess maybe I'm thinking about this because I'm thinking about some of these things that hit the wall really, really badly. And this guy had one of those, but before that, he had one that uh, that was something that a lot of people here will know and remember, I think, and was onto something. So, who, who knows Terry Green? Is anyone Terry Green? Terry Green. Sure. Yeah. So Terry Drayton is the, uh, he is the former CEO of homegrocer.com. Uh, and that was a company that was before its time, and they had the customer service thing nailed. They had it nailed, and they had great branding, great marketing, and I think they just, 
they were too early, certainly, and then they were, they got caught up in the in the whole dot com hype. I have to tell a story about homegrown. Cool. Okay. So homegrown. I, I moved to Seattle in ninety eight, ninety eight. It was homegrown. Came out in like ninety nine. Right. It was yeah. right. Here comes the grocery store. Right. That's the tagline. Yeah. Totally. Right. So I got asked to model for their. Their ah. yeah. So so I. Look at that. <laughs> I went to some house, they did chip goes, and I was all of a So now I really know the story of the failure. Yeah. <laughs> so, so now I'm in the paper, right? And, and, and if you home rush did a ton of advertising. Yes. A ton, ton, ton of advertising. So I'm all over the papers. And and so I walk up to my friends and like, so when did you start working for home grocery? I'm like, I had no I, I had no idea it was gonna be yeah. that big, right? So it was just hilarious. All yeah. my friends started to preach and they So you really know the story of that. So, yeah. so I was, I was on the inside for about a month. Yeah, yeah. Terry's a consummate entrepreneur and, uh, and he, he had actually had a startup that really hit the wall. Uh, there, was, there was a company called Count Me In that uh, he got into a bit of trouble in terms of uh, you know the, where that one went. But, and he's got a new company now. I mean, that's, that's kind of the fun, that, but, but back to Home Grocer, I mean, I think if they were just onto something, now you're seeing Amazon Fresh, you're seeing Instacart, and they they, they just got caught in the trap of, uh, you know, too early, and then the dot-com boom, and had to raise too much money. But, you know, what I was gonna say about Terry is, this is kind of the fun thing about this job, for me, is like, I can see these people reinvent themselves, and these yeah. new incarnations of people that had a, Kind of a great success to a point, and then they get knocked down, and then they come back up. And I mean, those stories are really kind of fun to watch. I mean, there's a lot of pain for those people in, in those in periods where, where it's not going well. But yeah. you know, I think it's a great thing about the startup scene, certainly, and it's one thing we need to cultivate and make sure that it's part of our ethos. Is that yeah, even though something gets knocked down or somebody gets knocked down, we got to make sure that that. It's okay for them to be supported as they build up their next company. So, do you think it's is easier? Or, so, describe what you think the difference between Silicon Valley and Seattle. Because, you know, in the startup community, you know, we talk talk a lot about you know the difference, like how does you raise money here? How does it, you know, how to hire people here? So, in your opinion, if if you had all the money you, you wanted, if you got fifty million dollars and you had a great idea, where would you start your company? Well, what I would do is I would go and raise money in the valley, and I would start it here. And I think you see, and you see, you do see entrepreneurs doing that, in part because it's it's very challenging to to uh, to raise money here, and it's something I've been writing a decent amount about, a decent amount about, about, and I'm actually concerned about because what I've seen is the the dwindling of our venture capital ecosystem here, and it's not a good thing that essentially you've got. Madrona and Maveron and Ignition to some degree, although Ignition's playing certainly a lot in the Valley now um, with one of their key partners down there. And so that worries me. I, I do think there's a lack of capital here for the tech ecosystem that's here. Um, and we need to figure that out because I do, I'm do. i still a big believer in, as much as I think the lean startup me methodology is smart and you know, to a point, I think it gets you, but you need money, and I mean, that is the fuel to, to really take companies to the next stage. Yeah, yeah. I just did a story this past week, and the Wall Street Journal came out with an analysis, and it looked at the 37 privately held tech companies that have a billion dollar valuation or more. And, you know, I pointed out there wasn't one Seattle company on the list. Uh, and that's not a good thing, you know, we need that bench coming up with two or three on those there. Those big ideas. Uh, and those big, big ideas. Because right? yeah. they're big yeah, ideas. Some of them do. I mean, yeah, the, the other point I made in that column was uh, we did have the, you know, the fortuitous success that we had two of our big companies just go public at last year. So we've got uh, Zulily, which has a $5 billion market cap, and Tableau, which has a $4 billion market cap. So. You know, not so, not so six, months, yeah, I, I said it's a nice problem to have when you have companies like that going out there. They actually, those two companies were in the top five in terms of venture-backed exits for 2013. And to have two companies that were in the top five for venture-backed exits is pretty sweet. So yeah. I just hope, I would hope that there's another crop that's coming up to repeat that success 
and we're not there's like there's we're not quite there. Yeah. Yeah. We have some there, there's some great companies coming up, but not to that. So do you yet. think do you think we need to improve the angel community or do we need to change or improve the VC community or what, what do you think? Both. I mean money. I mean just you just need more money it doesn't it. matter where it comes from. Uh, the angel community largely was supported by Rudy Godry, who's coming up as a guest here in a couple months. I mean, without Rudy, frankly, yes, yeah. the angel community here would be in bad shape. I mean, he, I, I heard the other day he's in 57 deals, uh, which that's a lot of deals. Um, but um, yeah, it's there's a missing piece here, and it's, it's one that we've been trying to figure out in terms of there's such a strong tech ecosystem here, and there's a lot of money here. There's a lot of money here. Um, but for whatever reason, it doesn't get recycled back into the community as much as you see in the Bay Area. Yeah. And I think it's something that um, it would be great to see. And so having successes like a Tableau or a Zillow, you know, in a couple of years when, when those people start to move out and do uh, you know, do the, do their own thing, hopefully they start to, to put some of that money back to work into the community. But there's a there's kind of this missing generation of money here of, of the Microsoft wealth and the Amazon wealth and the Expedia wealth. Uh, Rich Barton's done actually quite a bit in the yeah. community, I would say. But Amazon and Microsoft hasn't had as big of an impact in the community as you would think, uh, or as, as as I would hope. And um, because there's quite a few billionaires there. There are there are. In fact, I, I wrote a column I don't know 12 or 18 months ago about real networks. And I, I said, Real Networks is the is the forgotten superhero of Seattle Tech. Because I look around this community, and it is amazing how often I run into people that have uh, roots in the Real Networks, that have gone on to create big, important companies. Isilon, Sujo Patel, yeah. Paul Thielen, Big Fish Games. Yeah. I mean, the list is just endless. And it's not just here, the you know the founder of Linden Lab. Uh, they're, they're everywhere. And so there's something to be said about this idea that a culture of a, of a startup company like a real network that kind of hits a wall at some point actually can be good for the community. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, maybe having a Microsoft really hit a hiccup or an Amazon have it hit a hiccup could do something to spark that wave of uh, entrepreneurial energy here. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. So, and, and it's a it's a conversation that yeah, I mean, that's a debate that keeps going on and on and on, and people uh, people talk about that endlessly. In fact. We were getting to the point where we were commenting about it so much on uh, on GeekWire that people were like, hey, can you tone down the conversation on Seattle versus Silicon Valley? And I, I kind of agreed with that. Yeah, I think it was it was getting to be kind of brainless talk at a point. I mean, we have a role to uh, to play in terms of informing and, and, and sparking some of that conversation, yeah. certainly. But at a point, it's like, you know, it, you can just talk about it so much. And so we kind of dialed back our coverage on that topic. Um, now I've just put it into the Seahawks and you know all the comparisons, which I want to talk about that column too. If you get a chance if you have a question around that, because so, I think I have some interesting perspective on that. So, so talk, talk to us about are there any are there any uh, I asked you this when you walked in and you started talking to somebody about are there any people that you piss off that you uh, are no longer friends with because you wrote some piece. Well, Terry Graydon was pissed at me for a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, people people don't always like what I do. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. And it's it's a role that you have to have a very thick skin. You have to have. Uh, well, especially you know, in the social media. In social media today, I mean, they can respond. Yeah, they, they can respond, and um, which is great. And I think um, we welcome that dialogue certainly. Yeah. Um, what, what one of those comes to mind? In, some, in terms of somebody just getting like, like really you know, pissed. Like, um, oh, I remember this, you know, you don't even have to mention names, but what one comes to mind that you would like be able to share? Gosh, I don't know. There have been a lot of times where I've had to like diffuse situations. And, I mean, we, we've, Todd and I both coming out of very journalistic roots. Um, serves us well here because I think there's a communication style that you have with people that are upset with you and you know that you're going to upset people. Um, there was a great uh, journalist that I worked with at the Seattle PI who gave me some really good advice um, and uh, 
she told me, you never really want to surprise people. And so that was good because there's this element of journalism where it's like this gotcha journalism you're trying to surprise and get. And, and you really don't want to do that. You want to be, you want to have your facts lined up and things buttoned down when you do talk to people that, uh, that you're just reporting on the story and you're giving them the opportunity to speak. Yeah. And they can choose to, they can choose to speak or not. And it's up to them. And some people bury themselves either way by not talking or talking. Oh, yeah. And and um, and you know the, in this in this world of, of social media and commentary on stories too, it, it's just there's so much uh, additional insight and commentary that flows just through the discussion that occurs. So in many ways, we're just the uh, the impresarios or the, the you know the the guides along the way and point yeah pointing out factual information when we can. But boy, the, there's so much more that can. Become, be illuminated on by yeah. by other people. Um, what, what, what are some I wish I could come up with a better person that I pissed off. Yeah, Terry Grady was pissed. Uh, the ignition guys were not happy with me on my coverage of Intellium, I'm sure. Uh, that was a yeah. big cluster. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> you know, the thing is, we have it, you know, and maybe this is a good thing, or maybe it's a part of uh, the the transparency of media and social media now these days, that we really haven't had a huge blow up um, the way we had several years, years ago. ago. Yeah, so, and, and, the, and the tech economy is doing well and the startup seems doing, it's yeah. relatively healthy. I mean, it's when people start to lose a lot of money or things start to go south that people don't act as well as they should. So things are relatively healthy and strong right now. Tell us, what are some of the things you've learned from your you know, reporting and or interactions with CEOs that you would, uh, you know, if you were to start, if you and I were to start a company next month, like, we, we had a great idea and that came in and hey, you know, let's start this company, uh, XYZ, and you'd be like, oh, okay, what would be the things that you would bring to that that you've learned over the last, you know, 17 years, uh, talking to thousands and hundreds of CEOs and people that start companies? What would, like, give me two kernels of, Wisdom that you would say, oh, yeah. if you and I were starting, like, we're sitting down, we got a business plan, we're doing it, and you're like, hey Mike, here's some things that I've learned over the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and some of those are baked into uh, baked into what we're trying to do at GeekWire, certainly. I think the one, and it comes from uh, Richard Tate, who is a former Microsoft guy, yeah. who'd be a great guest, by the way. He's very charismatic. Uh, he'd be fun to have on. He's, he is the co-founder of Cranium, the board game, and now is running uh, the beverage company, Galazzo. And he said one time, uh, as it relates to startups, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. And so I really like that concept because th this is hard work. I mean, it's very challenging to try to build something from nothing, and you gotta be surrounded by a great team of people that occasionally can step back and. I'm not saying that it should be party time all the time, but you know, there, there's an you want to be surrounded by people that are there because they love it and they're passionate about it and they want to have some fun along the way. Yeah. And and I think that's that's a big part of what we are trying to do. And I think you mentioned some of our events. You know, we like to try to inject some of that energy into our events. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's playing ping pong or doing something with giant cocktail napkins at the gala or whatever. You know, we try to have some of that stuff going on. But uh, that one's really stuck with me. Just have fun. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's tough to, I mean, I mean you, you're having fun because you're doing what you want to do. That's, yeah. That's the passion you Absolutely. have. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you're not having fun, and you're, you're probably in a position that isn't right for you, yeah. and you're, you're doing something you're not passionate about. And I think you that know, gets back to what I was saying earlier about with my parents, how they guided me in terms of just find that passion, yeah. find something you're really excited yeah, about. Yeah, so. it's not like you have to have fun every day, but there's more fun days than not. There, there, there are days that are not fun, but <laughs> the whole I can't be yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, what would you, if you were again sitting down with, uh, let's say anyone in this room that was, you know, say they hadn't started a company yet, starting their very first company, and they walk up to you and say, hey John, I'm starting my company, it's doing XYZ, and I got, I got partner here, what would you say about that relationship with that partner would be something to be aware of? What would you tell these two young entrepreneurs that have never done it and 
they're they're talking about creating this partnership. Mm -hmm. and what would you give them advice as as a, again as partners? Because with partners it comes there's some baggage there. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of the partnership relationship yeah. amongst two co-founders yeah. is what you're asking about. I think. Yeah. I mean that's it is really really critical, and I've I've been able to experience that firsthand since Todd and I are the two co-founders, and so I've been able to really think about that and and, and analyze it to some degree. Um, you know, I think it's just really critical, and I'm sure many of the guests that you've had on here have said the same thing. It's just it's super critical to have somebody who compliments you, who brings a different skill set uh, to the table. And um, with with Todd and I, it's very much broken down. Our the beats we cover are very different. Sure. He has a he is certainly probably the true geek of GeekWire. He's more of a tinker. Uh, he's behind the scenes on the on the. Uh, on the development side, helping on the redesign, helping on things that we're doing more on the behind the scenes, sure. kind of nuts and bolts of, of that operation. And then I'm more outward facing, I'm more connected, more community builder. Uh, and those two skills just really overlap really nicely. It's not to say, uh, but, and I guess I would say another thing about that founder. It, it, it's all stuff that ties into being in a marriage, which I know people have probably said before. It, it truly is that, I know that's cliche, but it really is that. And, you need to know how to fight, and and fight and and get over it and move on. I mean, Todd and I have had, you know, blow down arguments, you know, where we're yelling at each other, you know, and I think that sort of tension in the business is good. But the thing is, that's even better about it is coming back, you know, not a week later, but even hours later after that, and then getting back to the root of insulting something. Yeah. And out of that creative tension, I think, comes something better. Yeah. We're just trying to make the product better. We, we have a similar goal, but we have different views on how to get there. Yeah. Um, and you have to occasionally, you know, suck it up and say, hey, I messed up. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. this was, I think you're right. Uh, or I overstepped, or you yeah. got to be able to, you know, step back a little bit. So I would say uh, pick somebody who's complimentary and, and also when you when you do fight, you know, make sure you can fight in a constructive way that actually uh, leads towards something beneficial down the road yeah. and make up quickly. Because you can't sit there and stew on something for a week and start off. I mean, yeah. it's like it's very dangerous. You got need to get over it very quickly. Yeah. Uh, and along those same lines, you know, when you start a company, you you know you've committed most likely monetary resources, you're definitely committing time resources. Um, is there a life work balance to you in the start? Oh yeah, this is a this is a whole can of worms too. So um, a number of people on our team have, have young children, including myself. So I have a four year old, uh, Todd has a three year old, Jonathan our chairman has a has a five year old. Uh, uh, Sarah, our new chief sales geek has a four month old. So we need to uh, live and breathe the whole work-life balance. It's actually something that I that I did learn just before uh, starting GeekWire, and you had mentioned it too that I like to play soccer and I like to eat, and I have my smoothies, my morning smoothies, yeah. which I wasn't doing in my previous incarnation, and I was turning into a awful mess. I was actually losing a lot of weight. Just running out of key for John speed. Cook. Get him smoothies. Yeah, <laughs> you know. I guess. Yeah, I, I tend to make That's so money. easy. Yeah, um, but no, it, it, it does get back to your point of like start the day, get get some good energy in with it with a smoothie. Make the time to get out, and exercise, do something that you love. I mean, for with me playing soccer, it's really important because I don't have my phone out there. As I mentioned, I'm out there with this this very very diverse group of people that are very different than anybody in the tech industry. I like that. It exposes me to a different type of world. I mean, I'm so laser focused in the tech industry all the time that it's nice to step out of that. Yeah, you know, like it's something not the real world. Yeah, yeah. And so it's good to get away from that. So, um, but the but it's hard. It's not easy uh, trying to balance a, a startup and a family. And you know, my wife and I have certainly uh, gone around multiple times on 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 uh, you know claw down, break down fights on, on how much you have to work. And 
you know, I like, I'm very passionate about what we're trying to do, and I love what, love what I do, and I do have to make a conscious effort to stop, you know, and, and you just have to do that. And I think I've gotten better at it, frankly, than I was three years ago. So a question from our audience was, do you have your cell phone on as your nightstand? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And do you answer? Uh, <laughs> this is recorded. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will. It depends what's coming coming through. Yeah. So you will answer the phone at one or two. Yeah. I'm sometimes working at that time. You know. Okay. It was. A, it was. Yeah. No, I have my cell phone with me most most places, and I mean, it's part of that. Uh, I, I was driving down here with with Dan and. I almost rolled into the back of a car because I was doing something illegal when I was looking at my phone, going, you know, just getting caught up on emails. I got way behind on email today to the point where, I mean, just during a two-hour stretch because I had to go out to Bellevue for an interview, you know, I came back and I had 115 emails in one email inbox after like a two-and-a-half-hour trip, and in the other one there were, I don't know, there were 30 that I picked. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of information processing. So I feel relief when I get that caught up. You know, and I don't. I'm not getting the email. You know, email zero, inbox zero. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but, I, but, but I'd like to at least get through it to try to process it. Do you, um, do you have uh, mentors? You know, people that I do go to uh, for advice uh, are kind of a diverse set of people, actually. Uh, certainly, Jonathan, our chairman, is a, is a great entrepreneurial resource that we that we meet with uh, regularly utilize him uh, to the fullest. Um, you know, I, I, I do talk to my mom a lot uh, in terms of uh, journalistic things and just business things. Yeah, my dad, they're both really good on on analyzing the business. I, I have a great friend who runs a bar, who uh, is a former journalist, uh, who, I, who I use to, to bounce things off. Uh, uh, there's a fella who, uh, Runs a real estate company here in town that that I, that has been, been a great mentor and sounding board. So yeah, I do. I, I it's good in this role just to be able to have people to go and talk to, you know, because it's a, it can be a lonely voyage yeah, doing yeah. a startup, especially one that's in our role where you know you're covering the tech scene. So yeah. it's it's nice to have that. Yeah, I do utilize that. And do you mentor others? You know, I think um, certainly in our own organization, as as it relates to journalism, uh, and we do take the time to uh, we've partnered with the University of Washington and their and their journalism and new media program over there, where uh, where we'll occasionally have uh, journalists come in. Uh, that's that's not to the point where I'm. I think I'm a mentor. I don't think I've really gotten to that stage. But we will have people come in and, and show them the ropes of what it's like to work at a at a new media yeah. company, and uh, so trying to do a little bit there. Um, I don't know. I haven't really thought about that. I haven't been approached, I guess. Okay. <laughs> well, opportunity. Yeah. Um, it's hard. I mean, it's hard when you're running your own startup to yeah. probably break away to do that. Time time. To do yeah. it, right? What What was uh, What What's been your biggest disappointment over the last five years? Probably. Uh, I, probably as it relate that it took so long to make the startup leap for myself. Oh, for you to start? Yeah, before. yeah, yeah. Because it's harder now. I mean, it would have been much easier had I done it uh, five years ago. Tech flash. Yeah. Been at that stage. Yeah, or if we could have broken out. I mean, in retrospect, a lot of people looked at a Todd and I when we left the PI because we left the PI about six months before the announcement that it was going to close. The close the print operation. And a lot of people looked at us like, oh my god, you guys were so smart to get out. Uh, that was such a brilliant move. How did you know it was coming? Well, we didn't know it was coming. In fact, most people in the community thought the Seattle Times was going to shut down and the PI with the, the big backing of Hearst out of New York was going to be the surviving paper because that's how it played out in San Francisco. And, and I thought that too. I just couldn't work at a newspaper anymore and be part of this bureaucracy. And so so we decided to make the leap out. In retrospect, it probably would have been very smart for us to say stay because I was there 10 years. It was a union shop. I was going to be owed a pretty good severance package and be taken care of. 
and, and plus during that lame duck period of three to four months while I could have built the new thing up. So I do regret that to some degree. But just, I would say, uh, yeah, taking as long, you know, startups are, are a bit of a young man and young woman's game. And, you know, with kids, it's harder. It's, it's certainly harder. Um, so, any questions, feel free to raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll field any questions over the next few minutes. I've got plenty of questions here, but if you uh, have a question, feel, feel free to raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll get it asked up here. So I've got a couple more that I want. I wanted it through. What's the funniest story you can tell? <laughs> funniest story that you had. Just the funniest one. I don't hear. I don't need names. I just want to hear the funniest story. That's a really hard question. That is really. Hard. I mean, gosh, I've, I've written ten, tens of thousands of stories probably at this point. I don't know. No, it's the like funniest, funniest to John though. The funniest to John. Oh. Not to your readers, like you, like John Cook said. You know what, honey, that was funny. This really is, this happened to me and I can't believe it, right? One of those things. I need a genre. I need to be, I need to be limited in my scope here. To try, to, try to pinpoint something. Uh, what about the last and, and not incriminate myself too much. Yeah, well, because, said, don't say any names, just uh, say the event. I've got, I've got a little, it's funny because I've got, uh, the, the, the people, I, I've got a little bit of a work persona and a little bit of a private persona. Sure. And um, where those two meet becomes kind of interesting. And uh, one, one and this isn't funny, but I'm just trying to use it as an example. Uh, like at our gala this past uh, past December, sure. you know, I like to dance, which you know, people, sure. people may not know, but I do like to dance and usually get out there. But I have to have the moment the music kind of hit me just right. And so kind of just start to bust it out a little bit at the, at the gala to, uh, to a point. But I don't know. I've, I, I, uh, I've, had a great, I've had a great run, great, great life. I've had, a, I've had a great upbringing, had a lot of fun throughout those, throughout those years. Uh, I, I, like to, I like to have fun. What's, like the to have fun. What's the weirdest thing? Give me a weird, weird thing I've done. Funny, not like you, just like a funny, the, the, you met a guy, you were doing an interview, and something weird happened. Oh, God, yeah, I got one, I got one, I got one. It took a while, it took a while, it took a while. Okay, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, so, it was, oh, I was at the PI, and it was around April Fool's Day. So I think this may have been an April Fool's joke on somebody. A, an entrepreneur in town was coming in to meet me to give a pitch and talk, tell about his story. And he uh, sat down, I, mean, I just vividly remember sitting there, and he was like, yeah, John, I'm really excited to show this to you, and I, I had known this guy for a little while. And he pop opens his laptop, and it is the hardest core porn scene <laughs> that just pops up. Uh, and he's like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa I, don't, I don't know how that got on there. Uh, uh, Wow, man. So that was a pretty funny one. Uh, did you did it get talked about? Oh, well, I, I didn't print that that occurred. Right, no, but, uh, it like, uh, wasn't for my note. I'm assuming he was pitching me for a story, so it didn't get written about in a story. No, he was saying. Yeah. But like a year later, he saw him, he was like, hey, what was up with that? Yeah, yeah, we never really talked about it. <laughs> yeah. Question. Yeah, so the question was, what is the area in technology or startups that has probably the most promise or potential going forward? Uh, you know, this region, I think you've probably heard it talk about a lot, is probably the center of cloud uh, innovation, and certainly with huge players like, like Amazon and, and Microsoft here, I, I think it's just going to be a, a very, very important ecosystem that grows up here. So you see, see companies like, uh, like Opscode, now known as Chef, Emerge, uh, you know, the stuff that EMC and Isolon is doing, and I, there, there's a pretty good infrastructure there that's pretty, that's going to be pretty interesting to watch in Seattle. Um, you know, Seattle's a, an e-commerce retailing juggernaut, too. I, I guess I'm thinking about, like, the strengths that are here that could continue to play out. Um, 
that would be another one that's, I think, interesting. Obviously, with the roots with Amazon and Starbucks and Costco and REI. Um, you know, the, we're looking at wearables a lot. There's, there's innovation going on there, this Internet of Things, hardware. Uh, yeah? What things are going out of style? I don't think you can make money as an app maker as much anymore. I don't see as many just pure apps coming up, like consumer-oriented apps. That's, that's a challenging space, I think. Uh, you know, for a while there, there that was how you, people were going to make Maybe. make real money, and I think that's proven to be a very hard business. Um, you know, I think telecom infrastructure plays are, are challenging. I think they're the big wireless carriers are kind of in control, and there's a, yeah. uh, four big ones, and the, I don't yeah. know how anybody penetrates that arena. Yeah. Um, I'll have to think about that some more in terms of what's. Oh, All the way in the back. Uh, so, what what do you think about how innovation is going to be impacted by the recent uh, reports about uh, NSA and privacy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that is a story I have not been following that closely, I can say. So, um, I don't know if I can say anything too intelligent about that. Do you have anything to add? I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, just, I, I think it's, it's a loaded question, too. Yeah, I think that's I guess a, I'm not intentionally avoid, avoiding it. I just don't know what to say about it. <laughs> uh, right here in the middle with the best one. Um, pivoting away from technology and going back to journalism, your roots. Ezra Klein just left the Washington Post because they wouldn't give $15 million to the kingdom. I was really closely watching this story. Yeah, a lot of parallels to what Todd and I went through. Yeah, and you talk about your own personal brand being in journalism and coverage, and covering different kinds of uh, stories and companies. How do you think something like that plays out in the future with people trying to build their own brand within a house and then trying it's, to break off? It's tough. I mean, Ezra Klein, for those who don't know, was the uh, creator of Wonk Blog, which was a very uh, popular, and is a very popular uh, blog for the Washington Post. And, he was in an intense negotiation with the Washington Post, obviously now owned by Jeff Bezos, uh, to try to do a spin out, much as like what Todd and I were trying to do at the Seattle PI. That's so I'm saying. There are a lot of interesting parallels, and I was following that story pretty closely. Uh, I, I think they are totally, uh, just given my experience, the newspaper is totally hamstrung there because they can't start to carve out entrepreneurial talent and say, yeah, go for it. Because I think everybody's going to want to go do it. And, that was one of the problems we faced, was um, it would set this precedent that uh, other people would want to then spin off and to do their own ventures. I think it speaks to the challenge that old media is facing because I think the real innovative and entrepreneurial journalists want to go out and be create something new and on their own. And it's, it's much more exciting and there's more upside and there's just more creative uh, ability to do to do interesting new things with with your beat and so it wasn't a surprise to me to see that he actually was not retained by the washington post ended up leaving he actually has now partnered with vox media which is a venture backed heavily funded uh, yeah. uh company and one that we compete against because they have a tech site called the verge uh which is very well you know very well received and it's a great site but uh you know that's it's it's interesting. It's an interesting position to be in um, from a publisher side because boy, I I I just think there's so much more headroom and opportunity to go out and take your personal brand and build something really interesting and creative if you can, um, and you don't have to have this big war chest of a publisher behind you. So. What's your favorite smoothie? My favorite smoothie. I'm a, you know, I'm kind of a traditionalist. I just, I just throw in what's in the, in the freezer, you know, uh, you know, the banana, pineapple, strawberry, a little orange juice, what I typically do. Yeah. I'm open for suggestions. I need some, I need to mix it up. I need some new recipes. Butter or chocolate in there? Yeah. They let me Just something to get the job done. Yeah, just nutrients. That's all I need. Oh. Do you think the online media monetization model will support? Same kind of depth of reporting and analysis that some of the old media organizations were able to 
It's a great question. Uh, so the question was, uh, will the new online model support the depth of media coverage that was traditionally supported by uh, some of these larger newspapers? You know, not, the short answer is probably no. Uh, but I have a little bit of a different take on that in terms of, I think because of the medium and the platform, you can actually do really, really interesting and creative things that you can't do in that other uh, model. And I saw this play out actually as I was covering the Intellium story, which is one that uh, uh, I've referenced here several times. Just so people know, it was a kind of a fraud case and the guy went to jail and he was cooking the books and it was a big to-do here for a little while. And uh, that's a story that I didn't ever sit back in my cubicle and go off for three weeks and decide, I'm gonna do the uh, comprehensive report on Intellium. But what I did was I was there every day, I was digging through court filings, I was getting tips in the comments from people who worked there, and I was doing real journalism. It was just over a period, and, and uh, if you looked at the, 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 the body of the work, it was probably as good as you know the, the, the big piece that you would do if you sat back for six, eight months and um, you know tried to do that big analysis. So my, my feelings on it is you can still do important journalism, you just tell the story in chunks versus uh, doing, uh, I was never a big fan of the reporters at the newspapers who, who were the projects or research reporters that it was a very prize driven mentality. I've always been like a hard, hard charging news reporter and that's what I like to do. And I think you get the best stories by being on the beat and doing those kinds of stories. And so I've just come at it from a different perspective of I've never been a, 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 now there's great stuff that has come out of that so I don't want to discount that, but it's just never been my kind of personality or my style as a reporter. And I still think you can break new ground by being kind of that beat reporter on the street and, and doing things day in, day out, and following stories as they develop. What, uh, what story that you've personally broken are you most proud of? The question was, what story that I've personally broke that I'm most proud of? Um, gosh, I keep, I keep going back to all these things that are like these big blow-ups, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let me say, let me go, let me change directions a little bit since I've talked about those negative ones. I really, really like getting involved in covering startups super early, the very inception of the idea, and watching those companies grow and, and prosper and turn into something really, really big. And so there are a couple of examples of that. Uh, I was the first person to cover uh, Zillow before it was called Zillow when Lloyd Frank and Rich Barton were getting together to decide that they were going to do a company. So I, I, I'm proud of the fact that I was there. And it kind of ties into the question prior. You know, I never did, I've never done a comprehensive story on, on Zillow, but I've done probably 300 to 500 stories on them over the course of my career, maybe more, I don't know. Uh, and so to some degree, I, I view myself going back to my history role or my history degree kind of as the chronicler of some of these folks and, and, and telling those stories on a daily basis. And, Oftentimes you hear journalists described as the front lines of history or history's first storytellers or what have you. And I, and I do kind of take that somewhat seriously uh, with, with my role. And so getting involved, getting getting in early and covering what was going on with Zillow was super cool and now watching it turn into a multi-billion dollar corporation. That was also the case with Tableau, uh, which just went public, and with Zulily for that matter. You know, And so I love getting in very early uh, and telling those stories. Most recently, uh, this was a good one, this was a good one. I, uh, I broke the story of the $50 million funding on, on Redfin, and there's a great backstory on this. So Redfin is also a company I've covered from day one, and um, have a good relationship. I've you know been very involved in covering them. Um, I got wind of the financing. The company had not pre-briefed me, but I learned later that they had pre-briefed a number of other reporters, but I was excluded from the list of pre-briefs, uh, which, you know, was a little, I was a little miffed by because, hey, I've been covering them, I'm the local guy, I'm right up the street, I, I feel like I should at least be pre-briefed on the news. But anyway, I, I learned that later. I got the news uh, with help 
from a, from a great tipster was able to dig into the Delaware corporate records and find out that they had changed their corporate records in the last week to reflect a $50 million funding come in. And the company did not want to talk to me. Uh, I broke the story at about, this was just recently, it was back in September, I think. Uh, I broke the story at like 6.30 at night. Um, what was kind of interesting to watch was the scramble of Reuters and Wired and, and the Wall Street Journal, like, what the fuck's going on here, Glenn? Uh, Glenn Cohen, the CEO. We thought that there was an embargo here. But my story was, was rock solid. I mean, I was totally tied to these documents. I put the documents in the paper, which they were in the, in the report, which they probably didn't like because there's other information in there. But I liked it because it was like, hey, you know, we went up against some big dogs of journalism, and we and we broke a story that we uh, we were we were competing on, and it was in my backyard, and it was basically you know, don't screw with me in my backyard, <laughs> don't screw with me, you gotta play ball, you know. And I should have been pre-briefed, and, and they admitted later they screwed up, and they, but you know I like that one because it, <laughs> it showed that there was some real uh, persistence in getting the story and and. Uh, yeah, that's what we thrive on. We, we love we love stories like that because that gets back to our breaking news roots. Yeah. I love that. I love that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. over here on the right. What uh, content mediums do you see as being the most uh, productive going into the future uh, as far as content? Can you elaborate a little bit more in terms of what you're saying? Podcasting is yeah. really experiencing a lot of growth in the last couple years. What content mediums do you think besides maybe podcasting as far as video? Maybe you do a lot of text, you do a newsletter, but what other forms of content or which one of those content uh, mediums do you think will experience the most growth going forward? Yeah, certainly there's a big trend towards video. Uh, we do some of that at GeekWire, and I think you'll probably see more of that going forward. We, we have a radio show and podcast. Uh, we're partnered with, with Cairo Radio in town that airs on the weekend, so we do some of that as well, and I think there's there's continued growth there, we have a good following there. Um, you know, I think there's a this trend towards, and I think you saw this with Nate Silver of the New York Times uh, going over to, to ESPN now, yeah. where it's this, uh, and it ties into a company also, Tableau, where it's this, uh, this data-assisted reporting that I think can be really, really interesting, where you're you know, you're use, basically using data to come up with really interesting stories and, and, and analysis. I, I would keep your eye on that uh, in terms of a, an area where there's going to be some growth because with all this data that's being created, there's just so, they're, they're just gold mines of stories in that. Kate, back. Yes. Yeah, all the way back. Great respect for what you've done and where you're taking the point where I um, didn't know that it was actually a very local Northwest focus, so that would be nice for training a little bit more. Um, on a positive point, it back to um, stats and, and startup. King County has, out of the nation, at least number 11 in the nation for uh, the number of accredited investors, and we're talking about over 55,000. How is Deepwire uh, bringing angel investors or accredited investors into the market and perhaps even investing in Deepwire? Uh, well, we're not looking for investment, so uh, we, uh, we yeah we're okay there. Uh, we uh, we raised a very small seed round and we ran off that. And we got to the business to, to profitability, so we're happy with that. Um, in terms of our, I, I'm not sure if I totally fully understand the question, but in terms of our role of, of hi, are you saying highlighting the angel investment community here? Or? You mentioned earlier about how Seattle adventure travelers yes, there are companies closing the doors, but what is growing is the angel investment and, and that network that is happening throughout the east and west of, of, you know, so east side, west side of Seattle, free of Seattle. So my, my point to this is more so, you know, support of BigWire also helps startups and you have the potential of getting out there, you know, that, that there's many more people who are able to invest. Are you about they don't know it. Is it a, um, sorry, um, not coming from some people who back to the startup and VCs going down and they're concerned of um, uh, venture capitalists and uh, investment in startups. So you, 
are you saying cultivating the net, the angel network? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Inquire to be more of a uh, a facilitator. A facilitator. Of that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think we do fill that role in the fact that we're covering it and we're, we're covering stories about it. And so we're an information source, first and foremost. So um, being, a, being a source of information, hopefully, is, is the first starting point of that. A second point could be, uh, you know, these people coming out to our events and potentially meeting an angel investor, you know, a startup meeting an angel investor at our event. So we're, we're not only a provider of information, but we're a facilitator at our real world events where people can actually meet and, and network and connect. Um, what I'm trying to point out is there are over 55,000 potential angel investors. They don't know that they're angel investors. Potential angel investors. They don't know, they don't know that they're angel investors. They don't know what to do. They don't know what startups are. They don't know what to do. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I think the best, I, I don't know if we have a role to go out and start an educational campaign to tell people that have a lot of money to start investing in startups. <laughs> I think what we can do is as soon as somebody hits the jackpot on an Instagram style success and they find out that their neighbor down the street made uh, yeah. you know, $50 million, they're going to read about that in GeekWire and they're going to say, what the heck's going on here? How did that guy that you know lives down the street from me uh, or gal? You know, make so much money, and yeah. so and they're going to learn about that through hopefully stories that we write. So, I would hope that's the the path. But um, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of money on the sidelines here that is not getting engaged, and uh, I haven't figured out a path to get it engaged. I don't know if that's my role. Uh, you know, I I don't know a way to spark people that have a lot of money to go and start investing in startups. I, I think it's up to startups here to be very, very successful and to return money to their investors and that the uh, the after effect of that is that people start to realize that you can make money doing this. We need more of those successes. Yeah, publicizing successes. Right here, second round, third round. Uh, so, I'm sure that you've been following on Facebook and the social media and the social net, 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 network and going forth. What do you think about that? Do you, do you think we're moving to a new stage? Or do you think we're just going to grow to that? So just the growth of social media and people consuming information there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are certainly new platforms that are arising and, and people are getting information in much, much different ways than they did 5, 10, 15 years ago and I don't see that changing. Um, at the end of the day, our business is predicated on creating great content that no one else has or nobody else knows about and getting that circulated through those channels. So to us, it's more like it, it's more of a tool than it is our primary platform. And you know, our thesis and our bet is that we can actually, uh, that people will still create great content even in a hyper-connected social media world. So I don't, I don't know if that'll play out that way, but that's, that's our bet. So I, I feel they'll continue to have a very, very important uh, uh, place. Uh, two more questions. Right here. I'm going to give you the next one. Uh, so, look at the room. There's about 80% of men, 20% of women. So, <laughs> in the entrepreneurial sort of field, a female, I think, plays a lot of the smaller role in this space. And so, for future female entrepreneurs, or potentially becoming entrepreneurs, do you have any advice on how we can yeah, I mean, yeah, that's one way to do it. Yeah, build something great uh, and uh, something that you're proud of and people will follow. I mean, it's the, the thing I like about the tech industry is it's, it's a pretty, and, and there have been a lot of these debates going, going for a, way too long, actually, I think, in terms of why there aren't as many women involved in tech and I mean, it, it, it's an important discussion. I think it's. It, I think it starts much, much earlier in the educational process, and that's a, that's a, another problem to try to tackle and fix. But um, at the end of the day, when I look at the tech industry, I I, I think it's a it's kind of an all comers type of place, I, and I love that about it. I mean, it doesn't. This this is what I didn't like about going to Gettysburg College back in the day. You know, I, it was you had to be from the elite school, and you were judged uh, based on who your family's from. I, 
there's, there's almost none of that in the tech industry. I mean, I know a lot of people that are dropouts that are very, very successful in the tech industry, uh, and or, or that are self-trained, and they're totally accepted because they're good at what they're do, what they do, and it doesn't matter what gender they are or what race they are. And I think the tech industry is far, far ahead of most industries, and and I I love it for that. Um, if you're a great coder, you're, you're a great coder, and you're like gold here. I mean, it doesn't matter. And frankly, women that are great coders are even more gold. Uh, I mean, oh my god! Yeah, I like the, the, so the fact. I mean, there's just there's just a incredible appetite for uh, for very very good women entrepreneurs and women coders. So I think it's a very accepting environment. At least that's been my experience. I'm not a woman, obviously, so I can't speak directly about it. But from what I perceive, uh, that's that's kind of where I that's kind of where I see it. Steve. Yeah, one of the emerging spaces you mentioned was hardware. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of technology and innovation. Um, I think Google Nest has really put that on a lot of people's radar yeah. screens right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know. Uh, when I talk to people in town, they say this is not a hardware town. Almost unequivocally, yeah. they all say yeah. that. Uh, do you think otherwise? Is that changing? What, what are you saying? I, you know, I would beg to differ a little bit with that, and historically that is true. The question is whether Seattle's a software or a hardware town. I mean, historically, certainly a software town. Uh, but software is powering all of these devices, you know? The device is kind of the shell to some degree. It's the software guts that makes these things great. I do see a trend towards hardware. I do also think uh, Seattle does have, I mean, the Xbox is here. I mean, the kid, well, the Kindle group is actually down in the valley, but um, I, I think there's, I think there's a, a good place where software and hardware is going to collide. And I think software typically still wins that day, the software inside the devices. So I think Seattle's well positioned there. One last question. So she asked your new all everything person? No, she doesn't get to ask a question. I have to take the guy who wants to ask a question. Okay, go ahead. She can ask me a question later. But you were just talking about software and hardware. So we just sold Motorola to uh, Lenovo. Yeah, yeah. So they're getting out of the hardware business. What, what do you think she's got it going on there? Yes, that was a weird one, yeah. I don't, I don't know, and I haven't read our story yet on it, frankly. But um, yeah, that was a that was a big surprise. Does anyone have any ideas on why that happened? Right here, what is the deal kind of? Well, basically, I mean, in the 1.5 billion, if you actually break it down, a bunch of it is for the patents. Oh yeah. But the rest is they actually got uh, a couple hundred million each year in terms of tax write downs that they would take, and that's why one of the reasons. Why Google bought them in the first place is for so many years after they acquired Motorola, they could take the write downs, um, yeah. and that actually brought down the deal to about four billion, I think, uh, when yeah. I did the math the last time around. And so that's yeah. sort of two billion cash. Yeah. 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 Right. It was, so it was actually only a ten million. Yeah, that's 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 an interesting one. Well, then you also have you have Microsoft that just bought Nokia yeah. and. Yeah. Bringing on thirty thousand employees, and wow, that's a that's a real head scratcher there. I mean, I mean, we didn't even get to talk about Microsoft. I'm surprised you didn't ask me about the Microsoft CEO. You all never talked about Microsoft. I mean, I think. Can I just add two cents? I think that's a colossal mess. I mean, we're so surprised. What? I don't know what they're doing over there. I mean, it just yeah. It's, it's a mess. I mean, they've no succession plan. I don't think there's anyone capable of doing the job, frankly. I don't think anyone can run that company. It should be four companies with four CEOs they're trying to search for. And like they are in a they're in a world of hurt right now. Okay. You didn't get to ask me about Marshawn Lynch or okay. Okay. talk about your Marshawn. Uh, Alright, I wanna do I do want to, I know everyone's been here for a long time. I wrote a column today on uh, Seattle style. And I and it and it ties back into our talks. And it was this discussion of whether Seattle is more Marshawn Lynch or Richard Sherman. <laughs> and so I encourage, there's a great discussion going on on it. I would just encourage you to go and, and read it because it does talk about 
our personality and our culture here as a startup community and what we might need to do to be a little bit more like Richard Sherman in order to elevate things. I think we got beast mode down, we're hard working, we're doing a great job, we're low key. Uh, just a few a little tweaks here from Richard Sherman with a little yeah, a little swagger and a little uh, Legion of Boom would do wonders. That's my that's my pitch on uh, the Geek Wire story you should read today. So uh, so first and foremost, thank you very much for being here, John. Thanks, great questions. Yeah, thank you.